Hey everyone, welcome back. This is episode number five of the You and Johnny Blue podcast. I am here today with somebody special, special guest. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she is here to help us get a deeper understanding of attachment styles and how we can implement some of this information into our lives in a more productive and more efficient way, right? We talked a lot about theory last week, and general information is good and it's sometimes helpful but until we really understand how to integrate that information appropriately into our lives we can sometimes be stuck so i want to introduce miss kylie baker welcome thank you thanks for having me yes thanks for being here somehow i convinced a respectable and professional woman into the back of my van <laughs> So I don't know how that happened, but hey, we're here. That's what's important, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So we're going to start by just recapping some information, general information about attachment styles mm -hmm. in case you missed last week. And then we're going to transition into some more usable data, some ways that we can apply what we're learning to our own individual lives. And we will be using ourselves as examples. Mm -hmm. So if you could maybe just tell us in your own words, what is attachment theory or in, mm. and or attachment styles? Oh, that's good. So attachment theory, well, I have to add the caveat real quick that um, as a licensed marriage and family therapist, we know a lot about a lot in the world of like relating. And I feel like the caveat is that I feel like an imposter because there are actual attachment theory theorists and specialists and people who do this like s exclusively. And so what I know is like a little about a lot out there, but that said, okay. that said, attachment theory is important because it's, it's sort of like gravity. It's no longer a theory. It's one of those things that's like, okay, it's a theory, but it's Whoa, real. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's basically that the way that I understand it is this, that we all have this internal biological mechanism for connection that uh, helps us know we have safety and belonging and love. And so attachment theory kind of highlights that that experience starts in infancy with a, a primary caregiver, and that follows us through adulthood in the way that we relate specifically to our romantic partners. What that is, that biological mechanism, the, the attachment style, and what we understand is that there's these uh, patterns of relating in those attachments, in those relationships, uh, that are, are become predictable and almost rigid because they become a predictable way of relating. And as you kind of delineated last time, that there are like two really common types, anxious and avoidant. And then there's another, the secure, but there's actually a fourth category that I don't think that book goes over, um, that some call ambivalent, some call it disorganized, and some call it like anxious, avoidant, or a combination mm -hmm. of the two. And that's that fourth one is a relatively small percentage? And, and to my understanding, yeah. And so with the attachment theory and in, in the different attachment styles in the book they said that the secure people take up about 50 percent of the population and then anxious and avoidant is like 20 25 percent each do you agree with that in your experience or is it not that clear cut i don't think it's that clear cut because i do think that all styles are kind of on a continuum i'm not sure if that book says like uh you know you're either a secure person or you're not that mm. would be if so that would be way too black and white for what we're talking about because the patterns of relating even though they get a little bit ingrained by adulthood for romantic uh, partnerships the thing is that we are inherently inter you know personal relational and so uh, another being can impact the way we relate right and so that's you know someone who has anxious tendencies might actually like the book kind of says slow down and able to kind of soothe when they are met with a secure attachment okay so it's so hard to say that like this is the population you're an anxious person you're a secure person you're this because it's so it's not static it's, mm. it's so um so much on a continuum yeah so it seems like there's there's hallmark traits yes. for each type of yes. attachment style. And so if somebody is wanting to determine what their own attachment style is, it sounds like you're saying the best way for them is to recognize which of those traits resonate with them from each Dominantly. style. Okay. A, sh a shortcut for answering that. Okay. So some, some, way to kind of look at what attachment styles are, are kind of measuring how comfortable am I with closeness, mm. how comfortable am I am, am with depending on others and allowing others to depend on me, especially emotionally, 
And then the third category is how anxious am I in relationships? Because there's sort of this quadrant of like how, how anxious I am, how dependent I am would put me sort of in that sort of, or how avoidant I am, like the relationship between those two matter in determining your style. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if I'm highly anxious, highly dependent and uh, highly interested in closeness, those three kind of categories, then that would be more of an anxious style. If I feel not comfortable with people depending on me and I feel a little bit more avoidant than of closeness and avoidant of neediness um, and low anxiety, that is more of the avoidant. Now, if I'm, if I have the combination of the two, that's more of that fourth category. That's more Mm. of the anomaly. Okay. So it sounds like, and, and in the, in the book, it references the stereotypes of male and female, like the guy who's always wanting to kind of get out of the house, Mm. go out with the boys, get some space. Like he doesn't want to feel smothered. He's kind of just trying to get away versus the stereotypical female is somebody who's wanting to talk, wanting to connect. You're not listening to me. I don't feel like you care about my emotions and like Mm -hmm. these types of things and how the male is stereotypically avoidant and the female is stereotypically anxious. Mm -hmm. And it does say that it has nothing to do with gender, but in our culture, these are sort of stereotypical patterns. Yes, because often men are socialized to not uh, like, you know, to not feel their emotions, to not have needs, to be independent. That's that's often an expectation that men won't be vulnerable and won't be show themselves, which would say attachment bonding is kind of based on that, based on having needs, based on having. Because that's seen as weakness, right? Right, in this culture. And so it's, hard, it's a little bit hard to determine what your attachment style is just based on what's happening right i mean people can go out and hang out with their friends and it not result in mm-hmm. it not be the result of being avoidant mm-hmm. or ha- exactly. or how would you try to make a delineation between what's happening and then w- like an outward action versus what's happening emotionally beneath the surface right yeah so that's that's the part where self-awareness is so key because they could be doing the same behavior for so many different reasons or a man could be doing that same behavior for different reasons one could be I, yeah i just this isn't a pervasive pattern. I just go out with my friends once a week or I, I go out because I have bonds elsewhere and it's not a reaction to my partnership. It's a, it's just a response to life, to having other relationships and balance. Then there's the second option, which is a reaction to the partnership. Now is the reaction based on their own internal avoidance of intimacy and that person's safe and available and, you know, there for them and responsive. Or is it a reaction to somebody who's demanding, somebody who needs more, who's blamey, who's critical, who's more of that anxious pursuer that shows up in a way that's like um, a little more unreasonable? Mm. Okay. So it doesn't, it's, you can't really judge what your attachment style is based off of what you're doing necessarily, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I know we're using the example of going to hang out with your friends and pretty much everybody would agree that there's nothing wrong with that. When we talk about an avoidant attachment style, it's generally more trying to avoid closeness intimacy. and intimacy, yeah. which would which often results in one of the things it talks about in the book is how even conflict resolution can result in more closeness mm-hmm. or intimacy right. and how sometimes people with an avoidant attachment style will very often avoid the conflict mm-hmm. resolution piece because of what it will result in. Yes. And so in that sense, if somebody is consistently like getting up after an argument and saying like, I don't want to talk about this, or I'm done talking about this for now, like we can talk about it tomorrow, that that's an action that may be indicative of their attachment style, but is there a chance that it might not in certain situations? Um, That's a good question. In certain situations, because because what we're looking at is the space between two individuals. Mm. It's almost its third, it's a third thing that has its own system, its own uh, set. Like it's, it's what we call a dance. There is a dance between two people. And that's in, in couples therapy, the most common is emotionally focused therapy. That's the most evidence-based uh, for couples, based in attachment therapy, but for, for couples work. And they kind of try to get you to focus on the problem and, and go against the problem, which is the cycle between the two of you versus you're avoidant and you always leave fights and it's caused by you or it's caused by you. 
it's sort of like the the dance between you is the problem. Mm. And so it's so hard to say, like, is that an attachment style or is that a, a result of a partner needing to talk about it five seconds after it happens and the other partner having a capacity that just needs to internally process a little bit more? Now, ideally, now a secure partner would say, hey, I just need a, I need a few to, to process this. I'm going to come back to you tomorrow at this time. Mm. Like, so there's a little bit more of like, our bond is fine. We're still connected. Now in this time of processing, I don't necessarily need silence. I'm not trying to punish you. You know, there's, there's so many strategies in there that like the behavior is I, I need to withdraw from the conflict, but I just need space to, to deal with it and internally cope probably because it's so activating in order to come back to you and bond with you, but not because I'm trying to ultimately detach from you. Yes. That's really interesting that you mentioned that because it a lot has to do with the dance between two people and what their arrangement is, yes. right? And so it's hard to like look from the outside and say, this is the way that everybody should deal with conflict. Mm-hmm. You should always talk about it. You should never go to bed mm-hmm. angry, right? Yeah. That's sort of like a kind of like yeah. a common saying, like, mm-hmm. don't, don't go to bed angry, but there's times when that might That's be helpful, right? Yeah. Or if somebody needs a lot of time in there, like an internal processor, they need mm-hmm. to like write it out or yes. something for that couple mm-hmm. taking time and like waiting before they come together mm-hmm. is actually what's best for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The first tool I usually uh, introduce to couples when I work with couples is timeouts. Because if we're in a, that part of our brain, the limbic system, which is all uh, emotion and fear and danger oriented, we usually can't problem solve very well. So if you know, unfortunately, something goes down between us, it can, it, it can light up so much historical stuff that's happened for me, especially when it comes to bonding. If it feels like a threat to, honestly, if the, if the attachment is threatened, it can feel like a threat to survival mm. biologically. Wow. And so it's important that we come back to reality, come back to the present moment before we can problem, problem solve. So taking space and taking a time out is actually really good. What's the best way for a couple to implement like a time out strategy like that? Well, it, it's such a, a detailed process of helping people even get own and uh, recognize what they're doing to contribute to the problem instead of like, well, no, if they if they were just like less avoidant, I wouldn't be so anxious. Probably not true. Well, if she wasn't so needy, I wouldn't be so avoidant. It's like, OK, well, we have to really it takes a lot of courage to do this work because there's a lot of ownership of the way that I'm showing up and contributing to the dynamic between us. So there's that step one. Step two is then turning on the cycle and the dance and being able to name that the cycle's happening. Wow. So it's like, hey, that dance is happening. They might use a language. I have couples that call out the word pineapple when it's showing up, like something benign. Because it's when sort of, it as in the pattern that's showing up. as that in the show- pattern of I'm bidding for connection and you're pulling away. Pineapple. Whoa. That's pretty heavy. So it sounds like you're saying, though, before you can, and is this the case, before you can recognize the dance, you have to be aware first of your piece in it? I think so. Is that's that, my bias, but. That's hard, right? It's really hard. I mean, that's really hard for people to do. It's like we're really good at noticing the problems in other people and trying to convince them of that. But like being able to see those things in ourself is like, Mm -hmm. that's hard work. It is, especially, I would say uh, it's often harder for the anxious attacher to admit that the way that they're trying to get the closeness that they say that they want so badly is actually in a way that is pushing. Wow. So that can be because really they hard. view themselves as the victim, right? Yes. They're the ones who want more and they're not getting it. Yeah. They will they love their partner more. They're willing to do more mm-hmm. and they're not being treated in a way that they feel like is fair. Right. Because they're willing to give so much mm-hmm. to achieve that and so for them to actually be understand that they're part of mm-hmm. the problem, part of what's pushing right. their partner away sounds like is yeah. is a challenge to accept. Yes. And for the avoidant person to admit that they have needs is also a challenge to say like, oh, I, I, I do have emotional needs, attachment needs. I have a need to be bonded mm-hmm. and to even acknowledge that is really hard. So that's why a lot of this work takes a lot of compassion and a lot of. Wow. Yeah. And that's really cool. I've heard you say a compassion a couple of times. So I want to circle back to that. But what we talked about earlier is how in the book Attached, it kind of demonizes the avoidant attachment style. And it makes, like we were just talking about, the anxious attachment style out to be more of the victim. And you touched on something that I think is interesting about how about how the anxious attacher can feed into the avoidance of their partner Mm -hmm. and how sometimes their 
a big part of the mm-hmm. problem too. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and I would say again, both sides. Both sides are it's fifty fifty almost. Depend. I mean, depending, but. But basically, you know, the narrative of anxious just wants connection and avoidant just doesn't. And if the avoidant could just be more secure, then the anxious would be okay. Mm -hmm. Versus let's look at both ways that they both that they their needs aren't getting met. And so uh, and the way that they're contributing to the cycle, which is ultimately they're not connecting. They're not having a bond that they want. So the way that an anxious person might start to pursue and try to get their needs met is one over reliance on the partner to meet their emotional needs or to soothe them or to make them feel okay when they're not okay or to be available for things that are really about historical traumas or historical things that you know a partner can help support someone as they support themselves but aren't ultimately responsible for or the cause of and so there's that there's blaming there's criticizing there's you know uh, once i've pursued you long enough and you've pulled away long enough then i get angry and mm-hmm. a lot of those strategies are those those ways of being kind of a show up so right so and this is going to be probably a complicated question and there's probably a complicated answer but how are people supposed to know how many needs they are reasonable like you just kind of mentioned that the anxious person is asking their partner to meet needs that are based off of like stuff with their parents Mm -hmm. or insecurities based off past relationships. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not fair. Right. Right. And you're asking like, like we can kind of all agree that's a little too much. You're probably asking for too much. Yes. But at the same time, if their partner is avoidant, then exacerbates that they're already telling their partner you're asking for too much, even when it's not too much. Yes. And so it's it's like, how are we supposed to know? That's a great, great question. I think it always comes down to present awareness. If both parties are trying their best to be present and are engaged in practices of presence, meaning um, mindfulness, meditation, whatever, whatever it is to engage with the present moment as best as we can and have awareness over maybe how some of the story of my past comes into this moment, then, then we can kind of assess needs a little bit better. That's such a subjective answer because each each couple is going to determine what feels reasonable or not. Right. That's um, part of their dance, right? And it's part of their dance. It's part of uh, personality. It's part of resilience. It's part of, um, there's so many different factors to that. But I would say, what are the most basic attachment needs? Affection, touch, sex, um, emotional responsiveness. Hmm. I mean, just off the top of my head, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. emotional responsiveness is key. And so what's what's reasonable in terms of I have an emotional experience, what's reasonable for you to respond to that? Is it to go into my insides and make me okay? Or is it to support me as I do that work, as I understand myself, as Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. come alongside me, touch me, hold me, you know, reasonable stuff, hold me every single night, cry while I cry to go to sleep. Like, is that reasonable? Each couple has to kind of determine that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. Right. But each couple has to determine what their capacity is for that. But so you mentioned being in the present moment and in that meditation is something that can help with that. But how does orienting ourselves to the present? It's kind of a ethereal like idea, like even orienting yourself to the present kind of confusing. I don't really even I mean, I understand what each of those words means like separately, but I don't know like what the phrase even like really means. Totally. Like, how would you describe orienting yourself to the present moment? Well, let's back, let's back up for a second. Let me give context to that statement because because we know attachment theory is based on our primary caregivers, right? We know that that is what created the map for relating hmm. in our brains, in our bodies. The map for relating and bonding to someone what started in infancy, so that's pre memory. So so when I'm engaging with you, my my brain is a neural network, millions of billions of neurons firing and connecting this moment with all these other associations. We're meaning making creatures, wow. right? So in order to harness that this, you're not my dad in my body. I know it intellectually in this part of my brain. I know you're not my dad, Okay. but in my body, there's some part of me that wants to attach like that in some way, if I'm romantically interested. So it's the same mechanism, same hormones, oxytocin released after sex. That's the same hormone that's bonding mother to baby. It's the same one, this bonding agent, right? So that said, it takes a lot of effort to come into this moment and not be in my associations that are even out of my unco- out of my consciousness, conscious awareness. 
one practice to doing that, to, to really knowing that I'm in the present moment, is being able to scan my environment and name objects in my environment and take it in through my senses. So what do I see? What do I hear? What can I smell? What can I taste? What can I touch? And what does it feel like mm. without evaluation and association? It takes a lot of work. That sounds hard. It's really hard. But are you suggesting that orienting yourself in the present moment when you're engaging with your partner is a way to help avoid bringing outside trauma from the past into our present interaction mm -hmm. so you can figure out like am i really mad at you because of what you just said or am i mad at you because of it or it triggered something that's happened to me in the past 100 percent and my is my anxiety that you're going out with your friends about the fact that i've been abandoned emotionally by a, a parent or is it about the fact that you we do not you avoid me we are in the middle of a conversation that's intimate and you leave or you know it's like um let me rephrase that so using the, de the example of you if you need space to internally process after a fight the degree of anxiety i feel about that i have to know is that about you needing space and at about this moment or is it about ways in which someone else has pulled away or withdrawn or punished me with space that's not about you at all so it's, it's sort of wanting to know, is my anxiety about this or is it about something else? And the way to do that is being oriented into the present. Is to pause that, yes. And so you said that ways you can do that is by engaging your senses. Yes. So by looking around or Literally feeling Literally looking things. around or feeling what you're feeling. But do we do that when we're in an argument? Or, or you know, like sort of how do I integrate looking, you know... Mm -hmm in the middle of this situation when I'm feeling anxious? Well, I think it would be important to say like during our take a break, hey, we're fighting, let's take a break in that space to not be thinking of all the ways my partner's wrong and I'm right, blah, blah, blah. You know, like it more in the thinking center. We want, that would be the opportunity to come down to like, mm -hmm. okay, where am I right now? Who am I? Is this person actually a threat? You know, like Whoa. come back to the reality of this moment. And one way to bypass the mind is is to get into physically knowing through my senses and feeling into that because that is kind of important right to bypass our minds in these situations it doesn't seem like our minds help us out very much no, no. the stories we tell can exacerbate the problem and exacerbate the both the strategies of pursuing and withdrawing because we sort of assume that in an argument the thoughts that i'm having are me right mm -hmm. and it's what i really believe but like mm -hmm. sometimes we just have random thoughts mm -hmm. coming into our minds that are mm -hmm. based off our past experiences and yes. this is what we talked about in previous episodes but the way this relates to these types of situations is sometimes i'm thinking thoughts or i'm telling myself a story during an argument that's not actually what's happening yes but i'm that's causing me to act or say mm -hmm. certain things and so it sounds like you're saying by one way to shut that off is to just, in a way, like meditate, mm -hmm. right? Which is sort of just being aware of what's happening around you. Mm -hmm. um, aside from orienting ourselves into the present moment by being aware of our senses, what other ways can we be aware of what's happening internally, like in relating to our attachment styles? Well, one of my favorite quotes is by Viktor Frankl, and he says, between the stimulus and the response, there's a space. And in that space, there's power and freedom. So even if we're not changing our behavior in the beginning, allowing that space to increase is a gift. So step one is recognizing I'm in that, I'm, I'm in that avoidance strategy. I'm in that anxious strategy. So hang on, what you're about to describe is is a way we can increase that space, like it, he's saying? Increase that space and and help break down these patterns. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So So no, step one is... Step one, well, actually, the, there's an acronym I really like that okay. can help break this down further by this woman named Tara Brock. She's a meditation teacher and psychologist. Love her. Hmm. And she has this acronym called RAIN, R-A-I-N, that helps with that self-compassion, slowing down the strategies that we use in relationships that unfortunately create distance, which is the opposite of what we want. So it's called RAIN, and R is recognize. And recognize is sort of like recognizing that the strategy is here. So it could be fear that I'm feeling. It could be uh, I'm feeling smothered. I'm feeling uh, scared. I'm feeling, you know, all sorts of different things. But the strategy of either avoidance or anxiety or a combination mm -hmm. is there. 
Mm. So it's recognizing and kind of allowing that with compassion and non-judgmental awareness. Okay. A is allow, which is the same thing. It's allowing it to be there without judgment, without trying to change it, kind of accepting that this is where you are. This right. is what's happening. Right. And, you know, with a lot of the self-compassion literature, really good book, Self-Compassion by Chris and Neff, hmm. the literature shows that with self-compassion is actually what creates an impetus for change a lot more often than shame or any other ways that we like, if we're like, we've got to nip that behavior. This is so stupid that I still feel anxious. This is the, like the stories we tell ourselves about the strategies that would actually get in the way of change. Wow. So self-compassion is super important. That's the opposite of the way we typically think about convincing someone to change, right? Is we like have to convince them that they have a problem. Yeah. Or like even with parenting that too. Bad. I mean, yeah, without getting into parenting, I'm not a parent, but, um, but yeah, at least in terms of relationships, like, yeah, the goal is to point out somebody's fault so then they right. can change it. Right. But mm -hmm. then you're saying that if that results in them feeling shame about what happened, that they'll be less likely or less able to change. Yeah. Less it often freezes the behavior. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned the first thing is recognize. The second is to allow, which is to sort of just accept where I'm mm -hmm. at right now. Allow it. Yeah. And But going back to the first piece, like recognizing what's going on inside we, is really hard to do. Yeah, it is. Right? I mean, it takes, does, does it take time? Yes. Is that pretty much what's required in order to learn about yourself is just time? Yes. Time spent so. doing this? Time, courage, and intentionality. Oh. And a letting go of, oh, I shouldn't say letting go, but sort of like a... I'll just say that it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of courage. Hmm. This is not for babies, but it, you can, um, like follow some prompts, like how, what have it been like when I've been interested in someone? Mm. So, or ask your friends, what am I like when I become interested yes, in someone? Yes, ask like, your friends. Cause they probably know, right? Yeah. They probably see you doing it and they're like, oh, here, here yeah. it goes again. Yes. Same old thing. Yes. Do I get obsessive? Do I start to question myself? Do I start to feel insecure about who I am when I, otherwise I feel fine? That's wow. more anxious. You know, do I obsessively stalk their social medias mm. do i plan in my head a future that's not based on the reality of this context or you know that's more anxious do i avoid a good thing do i pick her apart do i decide like all the ways that she's not good for me but i guess i could commit but i don't really want to commit um do i make excuses for why commitment is never going to be a good thing for me you know that's all more avoidant and so all of the behaviors you just mentioned are the result of our attachment systems mm -hmm trying to connect but in a way that's insecure or unhealthy mm -hmm. is that right yeah it's sort of that's what gets activated where we're interested in bonding with a so we partner. want to bond and and instead of maybe doing it in an appropriate secure way we go in these roundabout ways to try to get at what we want yes and it's unconscious so that's why we're trying to make this consciousness with R, recognize. Yes, recognize. So, like... so we recognize our patterns. We realize, whoa, when I want when I want connection, this is how I've gone about it yes. in the past. Yes. And then with A, we talked about... Allow. Just allow it. Yeah, to allow. Be, accept. Right? Not allow it necessarily to continue, mm -hmm. but to just accept where it is right now. Yeah, though we'll say that even pausing the behavior for 30 seconds creates a, a different pattern that's even better than just not at all to just sleepily go through life. Hmm. It's still better to recognize, even if you do the same pattern, even if you behavior hmm. act out the same way. So even that pause in between what you're feeling driven to do mm -hmm. and what you actually do can mm -hmm. even be helpful in terms of what you eventually end up doing. Yes. Okay. So we have recognize what's happening, uh -huh. and then allow it. What's next? I is investigate and it's not investigate through the mind. It's investigate through like investigate how I feel what I'm feeling in my body. Okay. So if I'm feeling anxiety or avoidance or feeling smothered or whatever it is based on your style, it's how is that showing up or how is my unmet needs showing up in my body? Hmm. And with the next one, N, nurture, that, that combination is really beautiful. That's really the ticket to... Uh, softening the pattern and having a little bit more healing is being able to offer that healing to ourselves. And that's what people call self-soothing. Yeah. So when I, in uh, I is for investigate, mm -hmm. I'm investigating where I'm feeling. Yeah, the where feeling. and how I'm feeling that feeling. So I'm feeling it like in my chest. Mm -hmm. I feel a tightness in my chest. I feel a shakiness in my hands. I feel 
like my stomach drop when I think about that person not caring about me. Yes. You know, okay. Like, and then allow again recognizing that, allowing that, feeling that, and then it's like, okay, what does that sort of tension in my stomach need? It needs a hand. It needs a hand. Whoa. It needs support. So you're saying just putting my hand even on my chest. Yeah. What other ways can I nurture myself in that moment? It can it can be through imagery, like a person that represents a lot of nurture to you, real or imagined, like a fictitious character, a dog. Uh, in real life or not because the body doesn't often know the difference between real and imagined so when you're imagining a nurture nurturing figure coming towards you and saying hey you're okay i'm with you i see you because ultimately again attachment is about belonging security and knowing that i'm loved so it's sort of being able to offer that you belong you're loved you're seen so it is natural though to get to to be driven to get that from your partner yes right i mean but it, it can even be seem like a natural, logical thing to do, even if it's pathological. But mm-hmm. it's like I, you're feeling yourself. I need to feel like I belong. I need to feel like I'm loved. Here's somebody who's supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. And so it's like I should go to them mm-hmm. and they should do that for me. Mm-hmm. And there and you're saying it sounds like there's a healthy amount of that. Yes. But there but that you should be able to also self-soothe mm-hmm. okay this is a tough question but i'm really curious like so how do we know then w- where the boundary is and like i know we kind of already talked about this mm-hmm. but this is just so important at least mm-hmm. in my own personal experience yeah and like i do want to ask you like a couple of questions about my attachment style but is is there a simple answer to that or is it is it like you said all just a part of the dance between the two people and mm-hmm. situationally dependent i think it's situationally dependent but i don't know if it's sort of like a uh, a percentage of like 80% of me is taken care of by me and 20% is taken care of by them Whoa. or something like that. I don't That's know. That's not very much by them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's, again, we're not a baby. You know, we don't, we actually don't depend on them for survival. It feels like that in those moments, okay. but it's not. And so when we're treating the partner, like I need you to feel okay. That's, that's, uh, it, it's, it's bad for both people. Wow. It's bad to hand over that much power to someone and it's bad to feel like you don't have any autonomy of your insides or right. your affect, your mood regulation. Right. Right. So so you need both. I don't know if that's the actual percentage. I something think like that. Something like that. I think some sense of basically that difference between codependence and independence is that murky line. It's sort of mm. like codependence is I need you to feel like I'm okay. I need you to make me feel okay. I'm feeling upset. So you're feeling upset and you're upset. So I'm upset. You know, that this sort of like, we are like inseparable and meshed. Yeah, exactly. Versus which feels good and bad. It's not sustainable and it feels good at the same time sometimes. And then there's the interdependence, which is sort of like, I know I'm okay. No matter what you add to my experience, I'm going to support myself as you come alongside me and support me too. We also have an understanding and contract that will be there for each other. We will respond to one another. I can meet your needs. I want to meet your needs, but it's not too much. And it's, um, it's that sort of fine line of I'm taking care of me while you also take care of me. Hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, so, so let me ask you this about my attachment style. Mm-hmm. So I think based off of what I've learned that I am secure slash anxious. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's certain ways that I resonate with secure attacher and then other ways I resonate with like the anxious attachment style. Generally, like they, I, from what I've read, like the anxious person has like a, they kind of put the other person up on a pedestal maybe and they feel like they're somehow beneath them or like they have a lower self-worth. Mm. I don't know if that's really true, but I don't really resonate with that. Mm. Like I feel like if I'm trying to reach out and the other person is unavailable or they're rejecting me, I don't internalize that as mm. being I'm not attractive. Ah, uh, that's I've, good. But I mean, I'm, yeah, that's... Not full-blown anxious. That's so good. that, I feel like, okay, well, at least I'm grateful for that. <laughs> But what I do feel like is like, I feel like I haven't shown this person who I really am. Mm. Like, I don't feel, I feel like I've somehow miscommunicated my intentions and, or like somehow I haven't accurately portrayed myself. Mm. And that's kind of what I feel anxious about. Like, so like, let's say I send a text message to somebody and they don't respond. Mm. I will start to feel anxious thinking like, I, I wonder if I said something in a way that maybe I was joking and, and they took, maybe it didn't go across text very well. Mm. And I'll like go back and read it. Like, 
is that really true? Mm. And, and like, instead of being maybe, I feel like somebody who's more secure would just say, I think this person is interested in me based off what's happened in the past. And the fact that they haven't responded means that they're busy, Mm. you know? Mm. And to add to that, a secure person would say, and if they don't like me and they aren't busy and they are ignoring me, I'm okay. Okay. So it's a double. So is it the fact that I, so is, and I know that we talked about, you can't relate behavior directly to attachment style, but me like going back to look at my phone and say, and like sort of internalizing it that somehow I may have done something that's resulting in their Mm -hmm. behavior or their Mm -hmm. lack of behavior. Is that part of my attachment style? It might be the, the kind of internalizing responsibility that might be more of that anxious style. So if I am then feeling anxious about this person or their lack of interest in me, like what would be a way that I could soothe myself like in that moment? In that moment, I might go to orientation and then I might go to rain. Okay. Like we just did. So, so it's like, and or fact checking, like you said. So it might actually be not true. So it might be checking the evidence. Does this person like me? Again, that's kind of a band-aid in terms of healing the attachment wound because it's like, this person does like me. See? Okay, I'm okay now. Right. Versus right. even if this person doesn't like me, how do I then self-soothe and be okay? Even if they don't like me. Even if this person who has my interest doesn't like me. Okay. That would be more the thing that we talked about. Rain. Oh, wow. I'm really afraid. What is that? What am I afraid of? I'm afraid that my needs won't get met. That this person I, I really like represents you know someone that could meet my needs and if they can't do it i feel afraid that i won't i won't get met i won't get seen i won't have belonging i won't feel loved that's recognizing recognize yeah allow yep okay i already knew that that was there i already know that i kind of struggle with anxiety yep of course that's there and then investigate how do i feel that do i feel like tingly do i feel like whatever nausea okay and then how do i nurture that Mm -hmm. with either simple self-soothing touch or maybe i call a friend maybe I do the imagination exercise around someone that's nurturing, offering me that support and that sort of mantra of you are okay, you do have love, you are wanted. That's awesome. That's really helpful. And uh, I'm interested to try that. I have previously tried to reevaluate the story I'm telling myself and try to address it from more of like a logical or rational perspective, but I've never thought to investigate what's happening inside my body and try to nurture that in that way. Mm. So that's really cool. Thanks. And hopefully, I think that's going to be helpful for a lot of people too. Thanks. Good. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want to share? I think I just want to reiterate the point that this work takes a lot of courage and self-compassion and to go slowly and to be gentle with yourself as you're kind of discovering what your attachment style is um, and learning how to respond to it in the moment, it takes a lot of courage, a lot of patience with yourself, and you'll start to notice things that you do as a response to this thing that's all, is by and large unconscious. So mm. I think it's just really important to be tender and um, almost conceptualize yourself like a little kid that really wants attention in those moments could be helpful, or a little kid that's feeling smothered and feeling like it, the world is too intense and too much, and and just sort of offering a different narrative about that even, and and then responding to yourself in the moment in real time with with tenderness and care because it's it's uh it's painful to know that like we ultimately all really have that drive for connection and do things that sabotage that so right it's like and gentle. shame can result in that too right yes right. and i think it's really cool you have mentioned that this just takes a lot of time and that can be discouraging or it could be overwhelming But the thing that's really cool and it's been encouraging to me is that you've said how even just adding a little space, Mm -hmm. like just creating space in the process, Mm -hmm. in the midst of it, to just say, I know I'm still going to maybe even do what I've always done. But Mm -hmm. to just like, to just even first recognize it Mm -hmm. and then to have create space for allowing Mm -hmm. it to just be the way Mm -hmm. it is for right now, Mm -hmm. that even doing that can already affect like a positive Mm -hmm. change and that's something that we could start doing right away Mm -hmm. right absolutely and naming it with your partner right away like oh my gosh i just realized i tend to do this thing out of fear or i tend to push you away because i feel blank Hmm. and being able to even name that creates intimacy 
Whoa. So even to be able to name, I do this thing, I probably will do more of it as I'm trying to figure this out and as it takes time to heal. Mm. And I know that it's happening and I know it's not all about you. Like I think it is in those fights. Right. Yeah, so. Whoa, that's really important. So to everybody out there, I want to encourage us to do this. I know it's hard, but I think it's so awesome that Kylie, you came on today to help us get a better understanding of these things. I'm excited to like try it out you know, to learn more about myself. And so, yeah, just want to encourage everybody out there to do it also. But if you made it this far, thank you. Appreciate you guys. And we will catch you next time. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> high five. Yes, we did it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we did it.